Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Associate Museum Director for Public Programs here at the Carlos, and I thank you for being with us in person tonight and those of you who are with us on Zoom. Before we begin, I'd like to read Emory's um, land acknowledgement. Emory University acknowledges the Muscogee Creek people who lived, worked, produced knowledge on, and nurtured the land where Emory's Oxford and Atlanta campuses are now located. In 1821, 15 years before Emory's founding, the Muscogee were forced to relinquish this land. We recognize the sustained oppression, land dispossession, and involuntary removals of the Muscogee and Cherokee peoples from Georgia and the Southeast. Emory seeks to honor the Muscogee Nation and other indigenous, indigenous caretakers of this land by humbly seeking knowledge of their histories and committing to respectful stewardship of the land. One of the things I love about the Carlos Museum is the opportunity to welcome back old friends. And tonight, it's been 10 years since Chavdar Chuchev was with us before. Um, and he came 10 years ago to celebrate uh, the coming to the Carlos Museum of the collection of gems given by Michael Shubin. And today he is here to celebrate the extraordinary exhibition that was put, pulled together from those gems by Dr. Ruth Allen, our curator, of Greek and Roman art. So if you haven't seen the exhibition, I do hope that you will um, make the chance to come to the museum and see it. It is extraordinary. It closes November 27th, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So time is growing short. If you want a lifelong memory of the exhibition, you can have a tattoo. Um, there's a wonderful artist in town Lauren Visconti, who as an art student at Oglethorpe used to spend a lot of time in the galleries of the Carlos Museum, particularly the Greek and Roman galleries. Um, she said she loved to draw the drapery and the curly hair of the statues. And so classical art has really influenced her tattoo work. So next Wednesday, the 16th, she and Ruth will be in conversation in this room at noon. Um, and then from one until five on Wednesday and 11 to five on Thursday, she will be in a side gallery in the exhibition, uh, inking tattoos from flashes that she, is it flash or flashes? Flash that she has created inspired by the exhibition. You have to make an appointment. You can go to our calendar um, and go to the event and it will take you to her sign up. So. We hope you'll come back for that and get your permanent memory of Ruth's beautiful exhibition. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ruth Allen and Shavdar Chuchev. Is this working? Yes. Am I gonna be talking to myself? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just press it and release. Uh, hmm. Oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's flashing and then doing nothing. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> At last. Yes. Um, just to follow on from Elizabeth's thanks, I want to extend my own. Um, Chavda is someone who um, I had known about for a while. And when I began working on, um, on the exhibition um, on the other side of the hall, um, he was someone that I knew that I wanted to uh, consult and work with and involve in the production of the exhibition. And so I was uh, incredibly happy when uh, when you responded to my email asking if you uh, would be interested in making a video for us. And, and you kindly invited me out to your studio in California, which was um, which was wonderful to see where you work and uh, and to learn from your experience and to you know, ultimately um, 
uh, work with you on the production of the video that's in the exhibition. For those of you that have um, have already seen it, you will recognize Chavda. And for those of you who haven't, I hope you um, do go just to see the video. It's it's worth it alone for that. Um, so thank you for your um, your involvement and for your generosity with your, your expertise and your knowledge. Um, and it's great to have you here in Atlanta with, with the exhibition. Well, uh, for me, it's... Uh... It's an honor to be here 10 years after the initial uh, visit. And uh, it wouldn't be right to start the evening without uh, saying thank you to, to you, to Elizabeth Horner, who made such amazing efforts to make this possible. And uh, to everybody else who indirectly or directly uh, helped for this to become reality. I don't know any other names, but I'm sure that this is a whole team of, <laughs> of people. And I think it's probably worth acknowledging that um, you knew Michael Shubin, who who ultimately um, donated his collection to the museum that sort of has formed really the, the core of the Carlos Museum's collection of ancient gems and very much the core of the exhibition. And it's something that's been very pleasing and sort of serendipitous about this exhibition project, which was, you know, involving you and involving our, our friend and colleague, Lisbeth Torreson, who, who gave a lecture a few weeks ago, who also knew Michael. So it's sort of been a nice um, culmination, I think, of, of his collecting and his um, desires for what would happen with this collection as well. Uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, we spent numerous uh, evenings with uh, Michael uh, either at uh, his house or at our house, um, looking at gems, discussing them. Uh, he would uh, uh, discuss it from his uh, viewpoint as a collector. Uh, uh, I would bring in uh, whatever I learned at the time uh, from carving them. And uh, it was really a mutual uh, mm -hmm. exchange of knowledge in which uh, at the time, I uh, I could only dream about uh, the events that are happening today. Um, it was, I hope that someday uh, there will be enough interest uh, among the general public, uh, not just purely collectors. Um, and it, it did happen. And now uh, scholars like uh, you and... Uh, others who are uh, putting uh, countless hours to organize events like that is just uh, really a um, dream coming true. And I'm very happy and I'm sure a lot of other colleagues who are uh, carving gems, which uh, steadily this number grows, uh, more and more are getting into it and becoming uh, uh, really good at it with, with work. Uh, I've taught a few and then some... Uh, learned on their own just like I did uh, 30 years ago so but I think this is time. this is the, the the question to start with how did you come to carve gems uh it uh it didn't happen uh, very early um very early on I was uh, well I come from a family of artists my father was an artist my my brother was is a great artist um so i had art and making art surrounding me all the time um but it wasn't necessarily related to gems my father was icon painter he paint uh, uh orthodox greek uh, icons um eventually my my brother followed suit although he graduated as conservator and uh, he became a great icon painter as well. And it was really the, the two greatest in the country, small country of 8 million people. Uh, and it just wasn't a place for me. <laughs> I couldn't really compete with them. Um, but I, I loved working in a miniature since I was, I was a child. Basically, uh, I started carving... Uh, ivory, um, walrus tusk, um, exotic uh, woods, so like ebony, ironwood. Uh, 
and I just love to work in miniature. I wasn't into making anything larger than a thumb. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, I studied also uh, conservation, uh, fine art conservation. Uh, almost graduated, but uh, I received my passport, and I this was in communist time, right? It was before 1988. Um, so I uh, I decided I will have to uh, look elsewhere for my life, future life, and career. So I left, um, spent two years in Greece, and then came to the United States. Uh, and here, for the first time, I was introduced to uh, gem carving and uh, spe specifically uh, intaglios. Uh, my first visit to the old Getty Villa, it wasn't renovated yet. So they had all the collection displayed in a different way. but. I came really close to masters as Epimenides of Palace, and I just felt uh, something there. And I said, I, "This is something I should be doing. I I want to learn how to." And somehow, uh, uh, by fate, a uh, few months later, I had opportunity to handle some uh, impressions of uh, gems. They weren't ancient, they were 18th century, done by great, great uh, masters as uh, Nathaniel Marchand and uh, Picler family. And I just couldn't believe that this was done by human hand. Yeah. And I decided, well, now is the time to learn. So I started, at the time there was no really formal uh, way of uh, learning it. So I had to pick information from any source possible. There was an internet, so I had to go to every library and uh, uh, find books on gem, engra uh, gem engraving or engraved gems. And uh, little by little, I learned the basics and I started practicing. Um, the first the first year was the most difficult because uh, technically there was really no information and I was using uh, dental tools in the beginning. Very crude uh, work uh, using them and uh, I knew that this is not the way. Uh, so I read in an antique book uh, that they were using uh, oil and uh, diamond powder. So I said, okay, this is this is it. And I started using it and nothing was happening. <laughs> and it took a year for me to realize, actually after I read another book which specified that they use olive oil, I, I was using uh, Vaseline. And this made <laughs> all the difference in the world. Vaseline doesn't work <laughs> uh, for gem engraving. And... Um, once I made the, the switch, everything started to fall in place and uh, uh, I understood. And uh, the rest of it was really practice carving uh, gem after gem and uh, learning something new from everyone, every new one you make. And uh, most of the learning was done uh, from the mistakes you make, right. as usual. Um, and uh, to this day, uh, this is this is still happening. We still make mistakes and uh, learn from them, and it will continue to the end. Basically, I know. I am. Um, I think it's so wonderful to hear you talk about the um, the allure of these miniature, shiny, colorful things that that seem so miraculous. Um, sort of speaking from my own experience, um, first encountering a gemstone in the British Museum, actually, and kind of thinking, how on earth was this thing made? <laughs> um, and unlike you, I was not in any way inclined to learn how to do it, but I was really fascinated by, by the, um, the sort of the, the, the materiality of the object and the, the skill of the craftsman and, and really wanting to understand 
what these objects were doing in the ancient world, kind of how they were being looked at and valued. Um, and I think it's it's also true that, that this was always part of the allure of these objects. When you look at the ancient texts that talk about them and talk about what people were responding to when they were looking at them, and it was all of these things. It was the the, the beauty of the stone itself, its, its colour, its luster, its translucence, but then also this kind of... Um, impossible to comprehend almost skill of the engraver and so for you to have sort of gone away and learn how to do that is is really something wonderful yeah it was and uh really the uh when you look at some of the uh ancient gems uh especially uh the translucent ones mm -hmm. which are done in uh, translucent stones uh they change so much with lighting the way you uh display them or or, or view them uh sometimes there is uh this play in light they seem to move yeah. they, they are really like a hologram like modern yeah. modern day hologram uh when you view them and uh, uh we are used to it now seeing holograms everywhere and uh, three-dimensional images and movies and all that but imagine for the ancient yeah. uh, observers how they would feel they would really feel like something magical is happening in front of them absolutely and there's you know that's exactly that quality that that so many poems articulate that you'll be looking at a gemstone and it will seem to be um uncarved and you'll move it in the light and suddenly this image will appear and then you'll move it again and it will disappear so it's it's exactly yeah. that um i've just put up on the screen a couple of stills from from the video that you that you made for us in which you um, create a replica of um, this wonderful chrome chalcedony gemstone with a satyr on it um, using uh, replica ancient tools that you that you um, sort of uh, created and sort of I guess estimated what what the likely well it's um, based, equipment would have been yeah it's based on uh, really the uh, engraving on the gravestone of the young gem engraver from Sardis, from, yeah, yeah. Roman times, where uh, it's partially preserved, but it gives enough information to uh, see that this is a two uh, vertical shafts with a horizontal shaft suspended and a bow. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have enough information uh, from even even today, there are people that are using the same principle. Uh, even for example, in watchmaking, they are um, doing certain work between two centers, and they're moving the uh, the shaft with a little bow, which has a horse hair actually uh, mm -hmm. attached to it, and and they're doing it now as we speak somewhere. Um, Another uh, version of the same tool is uh, there are a group of people who recreate ancient woodworking, especially turning, let's say, uh, wooden bowls on similar lathes, which are as big as from here to you, uh, a few feet long. And they are made exactly in the same principle from rough wood stock i mean nothing refined about them but they work and in that case the bow is actually uh overhead and the string is tied vertically and they move it with a pedal uh, but works in the same principle um so it was not difficult to imagine how it would have looked i just used the most primitive rudimentary materials and and construction to prove to myself and to others that you don't really need sophistication of the tools to create an amazing artwork it's just about the knowledge how the materials work and respond to each other and uh, perhaps a little bit of dexterity and I think a lot of dexterity yeah, a little, okay a little bit more <laughs> um, I what I really love about um you know the conversations that we have had together and what I think is conveyed in the video as well is um is exactly that that very intimate knowledge of of the material and of the 
tool. Um, and we, we've we talked a lot about how um, you're as reliant on um, uh, your, your hearing and on the sense of touch as you are on, on sight um, when, when doing this kind of working. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. I think uh, uh, Ken Lapatin uh, mentioned uh, some, of, some of those things in the relation between them. And it's really true, uh, more than one sense come in play uh, when you're uh, engraving. Uh, definitely sight, okay, it's the, the first one. And, uh, uh, but then we have to talk about people seeing differently. Some people see better from a close distance and some do not. Mm -hmm. And they need, uh, if they want to be gem engravers, they have to use some kind of uh, aid. Um, this is a uh, actually a great discussion in uh, in the field, and uh, I have my own uh, opinion, um, and I'll share it. <laughs> um, because I've seen uh, I've seen actually a lot of different uh, um, ways of uh, magnifying. Mm -hmm. It's not only a loop. Um, and then you, uh, there are other senses. Uh, obviously, the sense of touch. Uh, you constantly, when you're carving, especially in the old style, when you're using oil, uh, it uh, very quickly obliterates uh, the surface of the stone. And you have to wipe it all the time to reveal what you've actually carved. And... Uh, uh, can check the progress, uh, make the necessary corrections, continue the work, and you're touching it and uh, you are feeling the depth sometimes, uh, not only you're not confirming it only visually, but also by, by touch. And eventually when you advance uh, enough into the work, uh, you can start making impressions and ob observing the impression so you know where to continue. Um, but also, uh, uh, when you're carving, especially with the coarser abrasive, um, eventually the abrasive becomes ground to a finer fraction as your tools rotate and are in touch with the gemstone. And gradually, your the, the, the cutting action is ceasing. Uh, you're not cutting anymore, you start to polish, hmm. which in the early stages is not desirable. And this is very well felt with the fingers. The vibration of working with coarse abrasive are different than the vibra almost no vibration when it becomes ground and it stops cutting and it's only polishing. Then it feels too smooth hmm. and you know it's time to replenish and yeah. change. So that's another sensory uh, feeling yeah. that comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you can hear that the, uh, the coarse abrasive uh, produces a sound which is different than the fine abrasive and you can hear it too. Uh, but talking about um, uh, seeing what you're doing. <clears throat> uh, Obviously, a young person uh, can easily uh, focus on a short distance and work without much uh, effort and strain. Um, as we uh, grow older and uh, gain more experience, we we are confronted with uh, with a challenge. Uh, if you, especially in ancient times. If you want to continue, uh, you have to somehow see better when your eyesight weakens. Uh, but you gained a lot of experience, so now is the time really to, to do your best yeah. artwork. Uh, but, and how do you manage? So some people were just lucky because they were nearsighted. And they would continue to see very well, well into their uh, later years. Um, but not not always uh, a carver is that lucky. Sometimes uh, all, and we know that from the 18th century that 
a whole dynasty dynasty of carvers were nearsighted. Mm -hmm. That was true for the Piclair family, uh, who through, I believe, at least three generations were uh, carvers and all of them were nearsighted. Um, but, but then if you're not, uh, what do you do? You stop working and your best years when you gain, you know, the most experience are ways that you no longer can carve at least the finest details. Uh, so people must have learned that there is a, a way to uh, overcome that. And to me, magnification uh, is, is a logical choice. Uh, there is no really record that specifically says that they made loops from such and such material. There is a talk about maybe they used uh, bottles of water, mm -hmm. uh, spherical bottles, which would uh, magnify. They distort tremendously. Um, my experience is that we've seen in museums and private collections a lot of gemstones which are carved in cabochons, which are uh, convex on one side and flat on the bottom. This gem, before it was carved, was actually a perfect loop. Yeah. I mean, it is not possible that they will not have noticed, recognized right. and, and the, the opportunity they have to magnify their work. Um, and I think this was uh, probably uh, how, uh, how it happened. They would just uh, keep some of the, the cabochons that are made for engraving, especially the larger ones, and use them as, uh, as magnifying aid. There is another thing that I learned recently. Uh, if you look through a pinhole, uh, just poked in a, in a piece of paper or any thin material, actually, if you look through it from a very close distance and with good lighting, it clears your vision. Hmm. I can actually carve a gem like that, even though now I wear glasses and I have to use microscope. Yeah. But I can see clear enough from small distance, mm -hmm. like I'm using a loop. And this is, I, I can't explain exactly the optical, right. physics, uh, physical uh, principles that come in play, but uh, it works. It's not very convenient, but it's definitely, <laughs> if you don't have other choices, this is a way to see uh, detail from a close distance and, and it's a useful tool. Mm. It's um, it, it's making me think of um, the um, a few of the gems that we have in in one of the gems in the exhibition that that is one of those garnet cabochons, but that has the the lynx head on it. We were looking at mm -hmm. it today, and there's sort of the idea that 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 could have been used to uh, aid in the creation of another gem, and then they've engraved that gem with an image that's all about having sharp eyesight. I think is a really kind of playful idea i mean i i think it makes sense that they they're so uh they're so intimately connected with their materials and they're so skilled that why not have worked out how to yeah and, and again uh nearsightedness i think played a, a a probably a greater role uh and one one good reason because with michael specifically michael shubin um he was, uh, I think he had some kind of surgery in uh, one of his eyes and it was uh, somehow um, because of the surgery uh, distorted and he was so nearsighted with it that he had to put uh, the gem about maybe inch and a half mm -hmm. from, from his eye and tell me details which I can only see with the microscope. Wow. And I, I just couldn't, couldn't believe it. And specifically, we were talking about the gem uh, with, uh, it's a rider uh, on, a, on a horse yeah. and he, he holds a whip yeah. in his, and he, he told me, oh, look, uh, 
uh, they engraved uh, all uh, five fingers in his <laughs> uh, in his hand holding the whip. And I, I couldn't see this with the loop. I yeah. had to look under the microscope and I saw it. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, this is it. Uh, he could have become uh, a great gem carver if if he if he if you had been there to teach him. <laughs> well, uh, again, uh, like uh, I'm doing now um, with uh, and and you will try your hands and uh, Ken Lopatin has mm -hmm. tried. Mm -hmm. um, he carved his own gem. So uh, anybody who is uh, interested in willing, uh, you know, now they can. They don't. They don't have to read all the ancient books <laughs> <laughs> on gem carving to uh, to try their hands on. I will not be putting anything I carve in an exhibition. Um, I've skipped forward through the slides because I just wanted on the topic of um, the the sort of the family business of gem engraving um, and the the potential this offers to us for you know engravers who are myopic or, or sort of otherwise short-sighted and this being inherited through generations um we were very lucky to be able to borrow for the exhibition these two gems from the museum of fine arts in boston which are signed by the engravers um the one on the left by dios Corides, who um pliny the elder the the uh, Roman natural historian tells us carved gems for the Emperor Augustus and then Dioscorides' son Helos, um, the engraver of the gem on the right. Um, so we know at least of one sort of family that that kept the trade in um, through the generations, um, which I think kind of su supports that idea. Um, these are uh, two remarkable gems. In reality, not even an inch um, in 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 their maximum diameter, um, and we were looking at them today, and you were sort of talking about how how complicated these the sort of um, composition of these gems yeah, are, and how with hard the they are. One on the come. right with the facing uh, uh, faces yeah. and and the torsos, and they are very deeply. Mm -hmm. You can't really tell from the photo, but they are very deeply engraved and. The deeper you go, the harder it gets, uh, just pure, pure technically, purely technically, um, because of of the reach of the tool, the angle it can actually work, uh, and so the tip is working, but the tool is not touching the edges of mm -hmm. the of the carving. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier in cameo in in that regard because you have more open space around the image here when the image is incised you're uh, limited to how deep you can go and again um, Dioscorides uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, actually his uh, his third son uh, Eutychus or Eftichis mm -hmm. how probably is pronounced in Greek uh, he carved the gem uh, which bears uh, uh, not only extremely deep image almost three-dimensional uh, is the head of Athena um, but also he signed it with the longest signature right. we probably know that exists in a gem and that he's uh, if he's the son of Dioscorides made me but also uh, he was writing the place they are coming mm -hmm. from, uh, Agea, a, a town which is still exists actually uh, in Turkey. And uh, yeah, they were obviously uh, Greek, but they worked in Rome. Yeah. And whether uh, they were born there and came to Rome or just Dioscorides was born there, we don't know, but it's 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 a very interesting uh, story. And this gem, uh, I have uh, actually a plaster cast of it, and I've made uh, a glass uh, replica of the original, uh, which is in rock crystal, um, sadly broken. Uh, and it, it it was broken just recently uh, when it was removed from a setting, I guess, when it came to the museum's possession. Uh, one one other interesting thing about this particular gem uh, is that uh, it was described 
uh, somewhere, I think, in uh, the 16th, 16th century by uh, an Italian traveler, uh, Kyriakos of Ancona, uh, who uh, did a lot of uh, traveling in the Mediterranean. And he describes in, in his memoir uh, the same gem uh, being uh, suspended on a chain on a on a captain mm -hmm. on a ship, and he the, the captain showed it to him and uh, boasted about it, and then he was looking at it uh, through the sunlight and admiring it and describing it how it looked, and that's why we know it's exactly the yes. same gem. Yeah. Uh, but but they thought this is not uh, Athena; they thought this is Alexander the Great. Yeah, similar. <laughs> the the kind of ongoing uh, fascination with with looking at at these stones, they're kind of endlessly um, alluring. Now we know that uh, Dioscorides engraved both intaglios and cameos. Um, there is a cameo that's that's signed by him. Um, and we were talking earlier about um, your your preference <laughs> between intaglio and cameo carving. Um, do you like to carve cameos? And, and as an engraver, what's, you know, how do they differ? What's the process? A, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> Maybe carvers, that's your well, no, a lot of carvers uh, carve both. Yeah. And I've carved some cameos too. Um, I can't say that I don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, it just doesn't have, to me, I don't feel the same, uh, I don't know, excitement mm. when I'm working on a cameo and it starts taking shape as I feel in when I'm working in Intaglio. And uh, besides, uh, cameo carving is maybe three times or sometimes five times more time consuming uh, compared to the same ob same subject, yeah. just done in uh, yeah. in Taglia. Um and uh, it's it's just my uh, circle of uh, customers. Mm -hmm. uh, they they prefer mostly uh, in Taglia. Uh but my wife is a cameo carver too, and she she's done a lot of cameos in the past. Although now when she started doing uh, in Taglio, she felt in love in it, and she's almost <laughs> doesn't do cameos anymore. But it's a it's a personal preference. There are people who just never touch in Taglio. They um, sometimes it's uh, about seeing the image. Right. Maybe maybe with some people, uh, just optically, they have a hard time reading the negative mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. in uh, in Taglio, and that's why they prefer the straightforward cameo which is just relief and um so it could be different uh, factors for different people for me it just happened to be intaglio and then some people do three-dimensional uh sculptures very few in uh, such a small scale but uh some a little bit larger there are uh mostly cameo carvers in germany very few intaglio carvers for some reason uh but in russia there are very good carvers uh in the united states uh, a few some in uh, australia uh, actually almost on every continent now we have uh, <laughs> gem carvers we were looking at this example together um uh I a larger cameo, at least for, for our collection, um, probably about an inch and a half um, high, uh, depicting the Empress Faustina. Um, and it's it's a gem that you, we've all enjoyed looking at, and I think quite quite nicely demonstrates the, um, the ways in which the engraver could use these naturally occurring bands of different color within the stone um, to, to pick out you know different features so here we've got the brown of the hair the cream of the face but that incredibly thin sort of diffuse layer um, of brown on, on the cheek and the and the neck um he actually uh, the engraver did uh just an amazing uh job by leaving 
extremely thin layer actually this is the same layer as the hair mm -hmm. just when this layer continues on the cheek he just left enough to suggest the blush uh but not too much to uh obstruct the mm -hmm. uh, the view of the the skin of the mm -hmm. of the face mm -hmm. uh so this is uh, this is remarkably uh well done uh and uh, it takes a lot of planning uh in advance right uh it's not it doesn't happen by accident this is well thought out this is going to be my next question how often are you uh surprised by features within a stone well you you do get surprises uh every so often <laughs> uh maybe a little bit more with cameo than intaglio because intaglio more or less you have a a single solid stone in few cases it could be a layered agate with very thin top layer and you carve through it and expose the bottom usually darker uh, layer um but uh i, I will uh, just mention one uh, surprise uh recently last year uh so i was carving uh uh, an image of the Minotaur in a in a bloodstone for uh, for my son, his personal signature ring. He picked that from all the subject I ever carved. <laughs> he, he liked that one, um, and uh, uh, he chose it to be a bloodstone. And uh, I picked the bloodstone in such a way that the you know bloodstone is called bloodstone because of the red specks suspended in the green dark green uh stone right it's also called heliotrop um so i try to choose the uh, specks of red which is iron to be mostly on the body of the minotaur to suggest you know his battle with uh Tezeus. um and i succeeded uh very few on the background most of them concentrated in the body and i started carving it and there were a few scattered and then as i go deeper and deeper i discover recovered within the stone a fissure which was an ancient break hmm. uh this happens with gemstones they get uh, cracked or broken from exposure to heat uh, movement of uh, layers within the earth and over millions of years uh, water and uh, minerals go in and out and eventually they fill those cracks with new mineral and they become healed so they're called healed fractures so the stone is really solid but you can visually see something going through it and as i was uh forming the the body suddenly this fissure which was filled with red uh jasper appeared right in the neck hmm. going through the body i can probably we can probably see it on instagram yeah. it's posted there it, this looked like a like a stab wound yeah. or slash of a sword and i i didn't know i didn't plan on it and it happened right here it wasn't on the background it just it was where it's supposed to be it was a mortal wound amazing <laughs> and you know and this is something that that um there's a whole sort of tradition in in the ancient literature that sort of describes naturally occurring images in precious stones the kind of the wonder you know Pliny describes a um a particular gem that, that has Apollo and the nine muses that that are natural to the stone the kind of images there and this sort of fascination with um nature producing art in a way that 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 gems seem to be the kind of focal point for when when Romans are thinking about this so it's it's amazing Actually, I've to seen experience this. it uh, I've seen this happening uh it was years ago somebody uh, a gem cutter who was cutting uh you know agate cabochons uh he showed me a gem but it was his, his i would have tried to acquire it but 
he had the perfect image of a boat huh. with a sail, wow. which were just inclusions in the stone, but they were the, such a clean outline. Yeah. It wasn't, I, I studied it. This wasn't uh, made, man-made in any way. Just certain, uh, and if, if he cut the stone a little bit deeper, this would have disappeared right. or distorted. It wouldn't be yeah. the same image anymore, not even recognizable. But he stopped exactly where... He was meant to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back in the slideshow just to bring up um, <laughs> one of my favorites and, and, and one of yours. There is a, um, quite a story here. It's a good story that, that I'd love for you to share. Um, so this is a, a, well, it's a gold ring, a solid gold ring with a very beautiful green stone in it and I'm going to let you continue well it was listed as a, as a Roman gold ring with uh, plasma intaglio not not more much more than that and and Michael um, bid on it and acquired it it was uh, one of the bigger auction houses and I, I actually I saw it in the catalog and uh, when he told me this was shortly before he passed away um so he he showed it to me and he was very happy that he acquired it and acquired a fairly decent price for what it is mm -hmm. and uh and he said you know look at this beautiful plasma intaglio plasma referring to uh chrome chalcedony type of uh from the Agat family. Basically, it's a, it's not a common stone. It's a rare stone, but it's uh, it's steel from the uh, Agat family. And uh, I I looked at it, and it really I, first I didn't see the uh, black inclusions which usually uh, come along with uh, plasma uh, stones. And then the color uh, was more of a colder bluish gr uh, green than it is the warm yellowish green which is normally in the plasma you can see and i said mike you know this also some of the 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 inclusions the not cracks but internal fractures fissures that are in this one and it's much more transparent than normal plasma and I, uh, I told Mike, uh, you know, you, you have to check this because this may be emerald. And uh, emeralds are extremely rare in, uh, to be found in ancient times, in specifically in Roman times. Um, there wasn't really a source in Europe, uh, maybe some in Egypt, but rarely from that quality. Uh, and uh, he he did have have it checked and it turned out to be emerald and he was <laughs> extremely happy because uh, it was a surprise to everyone. Uh, I, I don't know if he consulted anybody from the auction house, but uh, uh, it's been looked at by yeah. a, you know a few different um, experts and and the suggestion yes emerald and perhaps specifically from India. Um, uh, although we know that in in the Roman period, you know, one of the the mine was in Wadi Sakate in the Eastern Desert in in Egypt. Um, I've always understood, you know, that there are very few emerald intaglios because the stone was was so rare in this time. And I've always sort of understood that that the stone was very difficult to engrave as well. But you sort of uh, corrected me when we were talking well, earlier that the difficulty comes less from the hardness of the stone and more from the sort of from characteristics of yes from of the it. structure of the common material because yeah. uh, there is obviously emerald which is extremely uh, clean and very homogeneous and it doesn't have the internal fractures and uh, imperfections which actually make it difficult for carving not because it's hard, but because as you carve and you hit one of those fractured planes, you can dislodge a large chunk of it and actually destroy mm -hmm. and make it impossible to uh, continue engraving it. The, the image would be lost and the, the stone itself would be no longer usable, 
not only for engraving but for wearing as well yeah. so um lower quality uh, uh emeralds uh, are uh dangerous mm -hmm. to engrave mm -hmm. um and uh especially nowadays uh, when we have these uh, modern treatments uh for especially specifically for emeralds for many other stones but for emeralds uh, when you have a stone which has uh, a lot of fractures in it, um, there is a treatment with a specific oil, which is very thick uh, oil, and it's uh, uh, injected under pressure and vacuum into the emerald, and uh, it goes and it fills the cracks, and the oil has the same refractive properties, so it becomes invisible, and the cracks become invisible, and the emerald looks like a, a great, great quality, uh, but if you remove the oil, you will realize that this is uh, much inferior yeah. quality. And uh, actually today we saw another treatment. Uh, one of the students that took the classes, uh, she brought uh, um, several uh, tiny little emeralds. Uh, she was just curious, uh, if you know what quality they are if they're any good and from a first glass a glance uh they look like a, a decent uh decent color um and they were faceted and i i looked under the microscope and the facets were uh they looked very uh not very sharp mm -hmm. which was unusual uh, normally uh smoothed facets you'd see sometimes on gems which are glass gems they were faceted models and then during the impression the facets were obliterated a little bit this wasn't the case but then i i thought i should uh, check the hardness and i took a piece of agate sliver and to, to scratch the girdle of it to see how hard it is and sure enough, uh, because it's the same or a little harder than agate, the agate couldn't scratch it, but it took off a paint. <laughs> they were painted green, actually. They were probably real emeralds, <laughs> but they were um, uh, very pale, very low grade. And then for the dealer or whoever did that to enhance their... Uh, appearance they just painted them maybe <laughs> spray painted them with green <laughs> and uh and from a first glance we uh, glance without wearing my glasses it fooled me <laughs> um this i do want to open um the floor to to others to ask questions but this i mean this reminds me immediately of um Pliny, as always, complaining about the glass gems that on first glance look like the real thing, you know, all these sort of um, non-elites in Rome wearing imitation uh, gemstones. And of course, we know also that um, uh, whether it was the engraver or people, you know, earlier in the chain, um, the production chain, but we know that precious stones were artificially colored and treated and treated with oils. Um, I've put on the screen a couple of gems that, that not definitive, but we think may have been enhanced somehow through, through dyeing techniques. Certainly the, the, the agate on the, um, on the left, we know the colors of, of, of banded agates, um, specifically the, the translucent bands were enhanced through sugar treatment and through heating. Um, and sort of this idea that, that the kind of, um, I don't wanna use the word forgery, but the, the, the enhancement of gemstones, the, the practices that we see being used today are often very similar to what was done in antiquity as well. Well, they 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 are uh, Pliny uh, very clearly uh, mentions about the uh, we, we we call it sugar treatment, but actually it it was honey treatment yeah. because uh, not likely they uh, they knew the refined sugar as we know it, uh, but h honey being a carbohydrate, uh, plain sugar. Um, works exactly the same as the uh, the white sugar. And what happens is that um, 
the the agates and chalcedonies they are uh, called microcrystalline quartzes. The difference between that and the rock crystal is that the rock crystal is a single crystal. Um, agates and, and chalcedonies are made with millions of tiny single crystals of quartz, which are packed very closely together. However, there is a there is a space between them, small, but there is a space, and that space can be actually filled with substances. Uh, in some cases, in modern times, with uh, dyes, uh, dyes which are so artificially looking, you know that this is not a real gem. Like pink and magenta and agate doesn't come with these colors naturally. However, uh, if it's treated with uh, uh, honey or uh, sugar uh, syrup, uh, it penetrates into the gem. And uh, after several weeks, you, it, this doesn't happen in a day or two. It takes uh, many weeks for the solution to penetrate, uh, let's say, quarter of an inch in depth. But once this happens uh, and the gem is heated up in different ways, it could be fried, it could be baked. Uh, from the temperature, the sugars inside become to become changing colors. Like if you put sugar in a pan and heat it up, first it becomes caramel, it becomes light brown, then darker. And if you leave it long enough and the heat is high enough, it carbonizes, it becomes black. This is what happens actually in... Uh, black onyx, you know, the very common black stone, which men like very much. Uh, it's actually agate, which has been treated with sugar and uh, you wear agate full of caramel. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, the, same, the, the same works with actually with the red. Mm. So this is uh, a carnelian, which uh, um, Carnelian rarely comes in nature in red and orange hues. Um, when it does, it, it's mostly yellowish. Uh, so I guess they have figured out uh, in ancient times that if you heat some of these gemstones, those that do not have any color, usually nothing happens to them. Those that are slightly yellowish, suddenly change their, their color into uh, orange or red. Uh, and now we know that uh, this is caused by the iron present into the gems. And eventually they figured way out to artificially introduce iron into the gem, just like they do with the sugar. Uh, and when they heat it up, uh, the iron changes uh, its chemical composition and it becomes, instead of yellow, becomes red and orange. Um, but for this particular gem, uh, the initial material, the uh, halcedony that was used uh, was so clean and clear uh, and transparent that almost it looks like a garnet, mm, which, uh, yeah, which is uh, uh, unusual because uh, always halcedonies and agates, they have some murkiness into, it, into them. They are never transparent as a rock crystal or garnet for that matter it's the the sort of the levels of craft that that go into the production of these objects is um, and, is amazing and i don't know if uh, the actual uh, carvers uh, would uh, right, or if this happened maybe or, or this earlier. happened in different maybe just like now uh, there are people that uh, and, and can talk about this uh, at length um, there are people who uh, source the gems. They either mine them or they just find them. Find them. I mean, I've done that plenty, uh, going to the mountains and going through the river beds in the uh, uh, Rodopo Mountains between Bulgaria and Greece, uh, and uh, found a lot of jaspers and agates and amethyst and 
most of the the ones that were uh, carved in in antiquity layer tagged as well. Um, I had to pull geodes out of uh, you know the lava flow the way they were formed yeah. because some of them you actually uh, find in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and those times about 30, 35 years ago, uh, we would go and we know where the areas are uh, for uh, agate and jaspers. And we go through the fields of uh, the villagers who uh, work the ground and clear up the field for uh, the next uh, uh, planting season. For them, the agates were nuisance. They were just rocks and they would pile them up on the boundaries wow. between the, the fields. And we would just go and, and <laughs> fill our bags. Wow. Uh, nowadays, uh, with I don't know, with internet and all the information available, uh, they learn that this is something that has some value, and uh, they they collect them and they pile them in their basements. And if you go and ask, they oh yes, we have agates. You know how much is this? Hundred dollars. Huh. Wow. Well, for something that is worth ten. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they don't know exactly so they try yeah right <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, and then uh, this is one way of uh, finding them there and also in many other places uh, just uh, they end up in soil after eroding uh, the coast rock eroding they would just uh, be dispersed in the in the fields uh, but I did find uh, uh, some that were still embedded in the uh, bedrock mm -hmm. you can see the lava flow and uh, uh they're just inside like little like little pockets like little bowls and um probably this is how they were find found uh, in ancient times in, and, even in yeah. even larger pieces which we talked about uh might now be exhausted just like it happened in uh, either oberstein yeah um We've had previous lectures, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction, um, from Ken Lepatin and from Lisbeth that talked about um, sort of the, the the sources of stones and the mining of, of stones. And I've just put a map, um, which is a copy of the map that's in the exhibition, hard to see on the screen, but at least gives you um, a sense of the sort of the huge geographical expanse from which precious stones are being sourced, um, certainly by the first century um but one key ingredient that we um that was not discussed by any, in any of our previous lectures but that is crucial to your work and to the work of the engravers in antiquity is this rather innocuous looking gray stone um just at the bottom of the the screen um still uh on the screen now so this is the naxos stone um you talked about how crucial olive oil was to um to your journey of learning how to engrave, but this is the other crucial ingredient that well, was also mined and kind of, of of great value. Not necessarily for my work because I started with uh, diamond mm -hmm. powder and I'm still doing that, uh, unless uh, it's some sort of uh, class or event uh, uh, just to prove that Naxos stone works almost as well as yeah. diamond. Um, but yes, without in antiquity, without uh, this uh, quite unremarkably looking rock, uh, we wouldn't have engraved gems the way we know them today. Uh, they just wouldn't exist. Probably the only engraved gems we would have are uh, some some marble gems mm -hmm. or uh, so soft other soft stones. But hard stones uh, cannot be worked with anything else that is found in in this well the old part of the world, yeah. Mediterranean. Um, they can only be carved with uh, something that is uh, more than eight on the most scale, and this is nine. Uh, only diamond is harder than this rock. Uh, so. Um, it, it, this this uh, this uh, material was mined since uh, ancient times. The uh, only on the island of Naxos, and there is a mountain which has a lot of, not the whole mountain, but 
there are it's the mountain is mostly marble but these are uh like pockets like lentil shaped pockets within it but huge ones i mean many meters in size and uh now in, in the beginning they, they were mined uh, uh from open pit mines and most likely because the stone is so hard you can't there is no tool that will allow you to to cut it or or break it easily uh so they uh, probably uh used the uh, heat and water so they would build uh large fires underneath an outcropping from the naxo stone and and keep it hot burning for many hours and the rock will get really really hot and once the fire dies down they would just pour buckets of water on top of it and from the thermal shock the stone will fracture so it would be easier to remove it as smaller chunks and process it further but otherwise it's not difficult to grind because while it's hardness is second after the diamond it's very brittle so it's easily uh just like diamond easily uh ground to a powder the perfect medium for this work it, it is and uh, uh again we were talking about uh, its use um well it's used in in gem carving is probably a very small fraction of uh one percent probably even less than that for gem carving but this was used and it was used until recently until i don't know 50 years ago or, or 100 years ago uh in great quantities uh, uh, naxos was uh, the only producer in the world of this material as it was in antiquity uh but nowadays not only for uh gem carving but also for uh, uses as uh, the tarmacs of uh, of uh, landing strips uh, on airports because it's so hard it doesn't its surface doesn't wear out as quickly as regular asphalt which is done with normal sand um, and uh, it keeps very sharp for many years uh, so it doesn't need re repaving or refinishing um, also uh, as an abrasive for making uh, grinding wheels uh, huge industry too um, but with the discovery of uh, new materials and very inexpensive to to make artificially like carborundum which is uh, uh, regular uh, quartz sand but it's treated with uh, carbon and it forms a crystalline structure which is slightly harder than naxo stone but it's made in uh in a normal factories it's very inexpensive to make not like you know digging into a right. mountain and um so in in ancient times probably it was uh i'm uh, certain and it was proven by uh, a conservator a few years ago that uh, the egyptians uh, knew about it and used it uh, for for cutting uh, hard stones, uh, granite, uh, uh, precious uh, stones uh, or semi-precious stones like jasper, uh, diorite, uh, and others, uh, and even marble because it was found in a hole drilled in a marble sculpture. And they found it on the bottom mixed together with remnants from the from the cutting of the stone and also remnants from the drill which was copper so they found the corroded copper particles together with the naxos powder which is there isn't really a, a better proof that right. this was, was being what happened yeah from, from the tiny to the enormous and and of course they would in granite they would drill holes with diameter uh close to one foot um still using uh tubular, tubular uh hollow drills so they would they would cut into the stone and form a core which core later was broken off and they would continue drilling down and 
very uh, very straightforward process if you have the right uh materials yeah. really yeah materials and the dexterity <laughs> well in this case dexterity wasn't an issue right. when you're working a bow which is 10 feet long <laughs> yes, no true and that's, we're, that's the job yeah. i could do um i'd love to open the conversation to um members of our audience here at the carlos but also uh, on zoom i know we're running close to time um but if anyone has a burning question because i could keep talking forever thank you for uh sharing your, your insights with us. Uh, I'm just curious, I haven't had a chance to look at the gemstones. What is the range for these stones? How far back in time does it go? It seemed like the first and second century was a peak time, but how, how much time before that? Do you know? Uh, Either one of I us think the, uh, one of the earliest uh, um, gemstone, uh, engraved gemstones, were um a cylinder seals and they uh most they mostly originated uh from the middle east mm -hmm. the mesopotamian mm -hmm. region um roughly five so if the fifth, fifth millennium bce is is seems to be the beginning there's there's some suggestion that it may have been a little earlier but by the fifth millennium in in mesopotamia so ancient iraq um, and then a little later, the, the Harapan culture in the Indus Valley um, are sort of carving gems in the fourth millennium BCE. So it's it's a very long standing tradition. Um, the, the exhibition is focused on sort of the later Hellenistic period, so the, the second century BCE into the Roman Im imperial period. Um, it, which is really the time when we see the sort of the huge explosion in the production of of carved gems, both in terms of um, the, the the number of gems, the variety of stones that are being carved, and the sort of um, uh, the, the the diffusion of gems across different social strata. Um, this really is the kind of the, the, the peak of, of that production in this time. And so that means by virtue of that fact, um, most museum collections comprise that, you know, the, the majority of gems come from that period as well. So that's true for, for our collections. That sort of was, was why that became the focus for, for the show. But it's also a tradition that, that obviously continues after that point and, and continues to today as well. Uh, what features do you look for to identify a modern forgery? <laughs> well, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on uh, because uh, ancient gems come to us in a variety of conditions. Some people would think, okay, let's see how much wear does the gem have it does the wear uh look consistent with being worn for a while or being in the ground for a while but these are not conclusive because uh very frequently a gem would come to us ancient gem let's say 2000 years old would come to us exactly in the same condition it left the workshop mm -hmm. Nowhere at all, per in perfect condition, polished, uh, no sign of use uh, or weathering. In because just being in the ground, a gem doesn't change in any way. Um, so, it the second way you look at a gem and try to determine if it's uh, ancient or not is by the way it was engraved. You're looking for. Uh, traces of modern tools um for example if it's uh if the engraving is very rough that would suggest that uh probably uh a diamond tool with a very uh hard very coarse abrasive was used uh like uh, a lot of the dental tools uh nowadays um, in ancient times, usually they wouldn't use that coarse abrasive because it was counterproductive. You, it doesn't really 
cut very well. So the abrasive they would use is uh, a medium coarse grit, which leaves fairly smooth surface. Uh, I see a lot of gems sold on eBay, which are modern forgeries produced in uh, um, Far East, Thailand, usually. And they're sold as uh, Roman intaglios. And I wonder, I mean, how much, uh, how far did the Romans go and deposited such a wealth of... <laughs> Uh, but those gems are usually uh, very rough, and this is exactly what I was uh, describing. It's obvious that they were used, uh, they were carved with modern tools. Um, and if they were done by someone with reasonable experience and they used the right tools and everything else was good, the last resort is to look at the style. But for that, you have to really have looked at a lot of ancient gems and get a very good feel of what an ancient gem looked like. They have many different styles, but somehow there is something about it which tells you, gives you a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. And there is no really scientific way to prove uh, one way or the other. Uh, gems do not like organic material can be uh, dated by carbon dating. You know, there are other tests which can uh, narrow the range, but gems do not change in any way over time. And uh, there is no way to tell. It's the experience of the observer usually. Doctor, I know that you have been such a great help to scholars and museums with your vast knowledge of ancient gemstones, but you're also a practicing artist with a thriving business. And I wonder if you could <laughs> just say something about um, your business and who are you carving for now? And, you know, and what do you like to carve? Yeah. And are, are pieces commissioned or, you know, just tell us about your own practice. I'll carve just about anything, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with few exceptions. Actually, I've uh, I've refused uh, uh, commissions because I didn't feel like I'm the right fit for this uh, this subject or this particular design. Um, I've also refused. Uh, commissions uh, because people ask me to carve gems and not sign them, which immediately, uh, well, it, there, there could be a legitimate reason behind it. Uh, some people find uh, the signature distracting, uh, but it doesn't matter. I, I feel that uh, a good gem, if I'm happy with uh, the work I've done, I I need to sign it. And uh, also, it because it has happened in the past that uh, a gem that I've carved was offered as a as an ancient gem. Um, so I, but that was in my early days when I didn't know how to sign yet. Uh, I mean, not how to write my signature, but how to engrave it. <laughs> uh, because it comes later, uh, the signature, the, the knowledge and the experience to do good enough signature to put it on a jam, uh, it, it takes a while to practice. Um, but anyway, most of my customers are uh, extremely happy when I sign the jams and they actually, they wouldn't have it any other way because they do understand that this is, uh, and, and they come from all walks of life, uh, all professions. Um, uh, I and from all continents, uh, maybe without Antarctic. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I'm really happy with the way uh, the art becomes a little bit more mainstream. This is this is far beyond what I imagined when I was starting. I, I thought I would be always struggling to find, uh, you know, the customers that would appreciate uh, the art and the time that it goes into it. And, and also, I just have to mention uh, how grateful I am to uh, my son, Alex, for what he is doing for uh, our business. 
uh, because without him, I would still be working with a handful of collectors who, yeah, they appreciate it. They, you know, they provide the constant flow uh, of uh, commissions, but uh, it wouldn't be like now where I'm a bit overwhelmed and unfortunately they have to sometimes wait uh, three, four months, uh, six or two years in some cases. <laughs> Absolutely. First dibs. <laughs> uh, that's just one thing. Uh, Ashley, I want to ask, what do you do with ones you don't like that you're not happy with? Um, you lay around. <laughs> well, I try to change that and <laughs> um, make it uh, in a way that I, uh, I like it. Uh, but yeah, there are maybe a couple cases where I didn't like something and I I started a new one and the old one is, uh, uh, no, no, I keep it as, a, as an example to myself not to do the next time. As I said, learning from your mistakes, it's a big thing in, in gem carving, it's uh, it happens all the time. Uh, sometimes some mistakes you inevitably repeat uh, because of many reasons. But uh, you try not to make the mistake. But uh, sometimes it takes just a second to forget and lose the concentration, and it does happen. And you try better next time. But yeah, I don't. Uh, I haven't really destroyed anything I don't like. Thank you all for coming and thank you Chavdar and Ruth for a lovely conversation. This was really quite special. It was an honor. Thank honor you so to be much. here again. Thank you. Can we drink some water? Oh, it's a hot water.